Hi, I'm Ray Young. I'm an emeritus professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And I'm continuing with my series of presentations on the history of Thessaloniki. Today, we'll talk, continue our discussion of the Ottoman occupation, which we started in part three previously, and we'll talk about the arrival of the Sephardic Jews. Now, last time I showed this slide of the change in population from 1490 to 1890, and you can see in 1890 now the population is mainly, uh, is, is the majority in the population is Jewish, 45% uh, of the population. Now, why did this, this happen? Well, uh, in 1492, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand II of Spain issued the Alhambra Decree, the Edict of Expulsion to Jews. And the, that edict meant that either they converted to Christianity, or they left, or they were executed. And many left, as many as 70,000. Now, at this time, the Sultan Bayezid II of the Ottoman Empire invited the Jews to come to his Ottoman territories. Uh, and uh, this was a, a godsend to many of the, the Jews because they had a place to go. But the question is, why did he do this? Was he just a benevolent uh, person in the Ottoman Empire? There may be some element to that. But uh, also they believe that the, the economy of Thessaloniki was languishing at the time and that the Jewish people with their business and commerce acumen would uh, enhance the, the economy and actually increase his tax base. Uh, it's also thought that he was a little worried about the Greek population becoming predominant in the city and leading to a, maybe a revolt or, or a, a separation of Thessaloniki from the Ottoman Empire. So it may be all those factors uh, were, was involved. But the important point here is that he did dispatch his navy and he transported thousands of Jews to Thess Thessaloniki. And these are known as the Sephardic Jews from the Iberian Peninsula, and they spoke a Judeo-Spanish language, or Ladino. They had their own Ladino newspaper, and they developed a very a robust, robust culture in Thessaloniki. And actually, it became the largest Jewish city in the world for over 200 years. And it was even called the Mother of Israel. So it really transformed the city. Um, and again, these were the Sephardic Jews, not the Ashkenazi from Europe or the Romanite, the original Jews before the fall of the temple. And here's a depiction of the Jewish family uh, on the left, uh, the clergy on the top right, uh, some gentlemen and women at the bottom. One thing you'll notice, they're all wearing, a, many of them are wearing a fez, the men. And this was, that was an Eastern head covering, but it became a, actually a status symbol or a, a symbol of success. It was a, a secular type of head, head covering so that uh, many people in the city were wearing it, more successful people. Uh, the, the Jewish population, the Shabbatic Jews, also developed synagogues related to their province in Spain. In other words, there was a synagogue for Toledo, for Aragon, um, and various uh, regions of Spain. So, uh, and I mentioned they also had their own Jewish Ladino newspaper, that Judeo-Spanish type language. Here's the Greeks, of course, uh, were a predominant force in the city, though not the, the largest population. Uh, you can see people are dressed pretty heavily. Uh, it, it is a mild, it, it's not a, it, it, it isn't a heavy cold climate, but it does get chilly in the winter, although it rarely snows. Uh, the, the gentleman in the center one is wearing the, the fustanella, the typical military uniform uh, of the early 1800s, but uh, now it's their formal military uniform which they wear as honor guards. Uh, and then there was the Turks, also a significant part of the population. Uh, here you're seeing their various garbs, the men in the lower left wearing turbans and fez, uh, women wearing burqas or not. And then there's a group of gentlemen uh, smoking the hookah there, uh, typical Turkish Muslim uh, relaxation method. And then I always show a slide of the whirling dervishes. I've never seen them. I would like to. And this is a Sufi path to mystical dimension of Islam. And what they do is they whirl around till they get into a mystical state and they, they feel they can reach God, have a closer connection with God. And they say it takes like three months to do this whirling so that you don't get totally dizzy in the process. It's still around. Uh, it's, it's uh, looked down in some uh, elements of the is Islamic uh, religion. And here I've shown a, just a, a variety of the different people that existed in, in Thessaloniki in the 1800s. 
uh, the Albanian Lemonade Man, a Jewish porter. The, the Jews were along the port, and they were, were uh, part of the commerce economy and trade. And uh, also they did a lot of the hard labor. Uh, down below you see leeches and socks being sold by the Bulgarians, and that looks like maybe an Albanian milkman. A very diverse and must have been a fascinating time to be in Thessaloniki. Okay, as in many populations around the world where you have uh, groups of ethnic people, they tend to congregate in neighborhoods, and, and likewise with Thessaloniki. And you can see at the, the northern, uh, north uh, western end is the Muslim population, the Greeks at the eastern side of the city, and the Jewish population uh, lived uh, at the south eastern end of the city, mainly occupying most of the port area of the city. Now in the upper town, as I mentioned, was Muslim, and in the upper town uh, was the birthplace of Mustafa Kamal Ataturk. He was a member of the Young Turks movement of 1908. Um, and the Young Turks movement developed in Thessaloniki. Uh, I've shown a picture of the upper town where he was uh, born uh, on the left, you can see they have that overhanging second floor, which is typical of the Turkish Muslims population. On the right, you can also see overhanging upper floors and a Muslim woman in a burqa. Now, Musafa Kamal Ataturk became the Turkish president in 1923 for 15 years, and he's credited with westernizing and modernizing the Turkish, uh, Turkish country. Uh, more secular rights, equal rights for women, uh, they had an early uh, early voting privilege in, in uh, Turkey. Uh, the language was script was from Arabic to Roman. Uh, the attire was more Western, and he advanced the arts, science, and, and so on. So uh, he had a significant impact on Turkey. And uh, many the Turks that visit Thessaloniki want to visit his museum, which has been restored, his home, which is now a museum, which has been restored, shown on the upper right. That's his birthplace. And you can see the upper town uh, has been pretty much uh, modernized and a very pleasant place. And, and as I mentioned, the Turks like to visit his birthplace. Here's a view from the upper town down to the, uh, the, ports, the port of Thessaloniki. And you can see in the center is that rotundra from the Galerian complex, the palace of Emperor Galerius during the Roman times. And off to the left, you can see the White Tower still in existence uh, in Thessaloniki. And you can also see how densely populated that city has become. Okay, there's a, quite a few remnants of the uh, Turkish occupation still in the city, and I'm, I'm excited to see that they've maintained these. There's uh, uh, about f four different hammams or Turkish baths, uh, the Bey Hammam and the Yahuda Hammam. Uh, one of these was said to have still been in operation uh, up until about 1960, but none of them are operating now, and some are converted into little shops, such as that flower shop. There's also about five mosques still in the town. Oh, I think only one of them is still operational. Uh, you can see they're rest restoring one of these particular mosques in the city, which is, is great because it's a big part of the Thessaloniki history. Okay. We're now up to 1912. The population I've shown in 1890 is mostly the Sephardic Jews. They're now 54,000 or 45 percent, as I mentioned previously. But if, if as we get to 1912, which was up to the end of the Turkish population, you can see that the Jewish population has diminished somewhat in percentage, but is still the major population. But the Turkish population, the Turkish Muslims, have now superseded the Greek population. So the Greek population is now the major, major, minority in this population of 158,000 people. So on my next slide, we're going to talk about what ha occurred after the end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, uh, the freeing of the Greek, Greek uh, country, and uh, of a period of 37 years. And as I mentioned, this was a period of great turmoil of a large number of wars. We'll talk about that next time. Thank you.